Hey everybody, it's Talk Gnosis. It's the show about Gnosticism and how it intersects with theology, art, culture, and whatever we want to talk about. Like, look, Gnosticism, it's a totalizing system. That means whatever I'm interested in this week, I can somehow weave it into the topic. I'm one of your hosts, Deacon John, joined by my co-host, Jason. Hey, Jason. Hey there. And our guest is the filmmaker, podcaster, and academic, Helen Rollins. Helen, welcome to the Hello. show. Hello. Am I an academic? Oh. <laughs> My, I, think a, 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 I think you are. I think I think you are. Slight way. In, in mm. a slight way. Yeah. Well, you. I, we'll talk about this later on in the show. But uh, you do a lot with the Global Center for for Advanced Study, and and I understand you actually volunteer with them, uh, advising a severely mentally challenged man. So it's yeah, a, a, no, a person exactly. With, it's very it's, kind. I of did you. it out of the goodness of my own heart, really. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing. How can I help this work. troubled man? <laughs> <laughs> Severe brain damage. Should, um, should, should we uh, uh, explain that in joke? For the, yes. For the yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, if, if anybody found that joke ableist, please complain to Jason at GnosticWisdom.net. That is, of course, our uh, <laughs> our complaints department. But uh, Helen is my my thesis advisor at GCAS. I am doing. Uh, the two, two, two papers, two dissertations, two theses mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the topic of Gnosticism. And uh, Helen has been uh, immensely helpful so far. And uh, saying before the show, she, she's never going to want to hear the G word ever again. So, well, I was going to say, um, I'm glad, I'm glad you feel that way because Gnosticism is a mystery to me. So, it, same, same here. Okay. <laughs> that's, uh, and this is the thing is that that's the idea like the, the, mm -hmm. the certain gnosis is like the unknowable knowing like it's that okay. it's that that uh the thing that you can't it's like it's like sort of a buddhist enlightenment kind of thing mm -hmm. um that uh the act of reaching it is never going to happen but we always keep striving anyway yeah it's Very it's good. We find ourselves in the striving, and uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I've been reflecting a lot on Gnosticism's a dead religion, right? Uh, it, it was, but it's very influential. Um, so, you know, we're part of a revival, and you know, I think a, a lot of my work on the show, a lot of my work at GCAS, is actually pointing out just how influential it is. I actually, uh, mm -hmm. Jason, I, I did a show with Nick, uh, with, with Dr. Nathan Theorgi, uh, a two and a half hour show. Uh, he, he's a brilliant man. He, he's very articulate. But, you know, he, he flat out said, you know, Hegel was a Gnostic. Just no, no, no two ways about it. Just, he, he said that exact statement. And I agree with him. And Helen will get to read all about it in uh, six months to, to four years. The, the fun <laughs> thing about this show is that there's going to be multiple people watching that I owe papers to. So, Creston, <laughs> Sean, they're coming, I swear. Uh, okay, we, we better get into this. We are into this. This is an authentic conversation. Um, Helen, uh, Instead of talking about you and around you, uh, something mm -hmm. I do really like uh, in your podcasting work is is that you do like to discover truth or the way to truth through through dialogue, through talking, and through yeah. talking it out. I yeah. mean, this is it's interesting because I don't know whether I've I've kind of reached a different, um, you know, I mean, to be gnostic with I don't know if this is gnostic about it, but you know, <laughs> this sort of coming to knowledge through action potential, through seeking something, and then coming to something greater I don't know my my opinions on um social media which I guess in a way podcasts might be part of this phenomenon or part of this sort of um in this sort of vein but I st set up a podcast that originally in uh, a few years ago with my friend Adrian Romero because we felt that um we wanted to sort of like adopt a psychoanalytic kind of approach that maybe is is it like a, a um a dynamic in psychoanalysis that isn't really foregrounded in the like cultural understanding of psychoanalysis and that is speaking addressing your public so having honest conversations um in the presence of other people um and i mean this i guess this kind of relates to the public and the private and the way psychoanalysis mm. understands the public and the private and i would say that the issue i i have with um social media is that it pretends to be public but it's really private so and I'm I'm not 100% sure how this fits in with podcasting but the attempt was to have a public conversation um honestly in a way that sort of displayed ourselves uh, as divided beings and that you know that we and I did I did sort of discover that I came to um work out what I thought through conversation, which I think is something that is lacking today. 
um, and that's part of the reason why we chose the word but the name the lack for my current podcast which is um the progress that i, I moved to from my original podcast um but it's the same sort of premise and um you know so so we it has a sort of i mean i kind of am interested in um lacan's work and uh there is this sort of lacanian bent to it um but also uh, so, so, so I guess that's where like the, the philosophical idea, the lack comes in. But also another thing we felt was lacking were conversations uh, between um, people from different disciplines. And not only that, people from different disciplines who have different points of view. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So and we have a, a three way conversation about uh, a cultural artifact every week. And we have different, you know, there, there are crossovers, like actually a lot of crossovers between there's three of us, me, Benjamin, Steve Becker, and Nina Power, Nina Power, but part of the way it works is that we have a kind of a confrontation between different viewpoints and that that is generative. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was going to say that <laughs> it is. I, I think it's, a, it's, it's my favorite podcast. It, right. You folks have a, enough <laughs> that, that's different about you to, so that there is a place of meeting, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and actually, some of my favorite episodes are the ones where you more strongly disagree with each other, with, which is yeah. always, you know, you always keep it contained in, in, in wonderful ways. So, uh, yeah, everybody uh, go to patreon.com slash the lack podcast. So, uh, okay. And, and also just okay. take a quick moment to say so yeah that helen's a um a, a great podcaster and uh like interviewee as she's happening here right now but also um has done a lot of great filmmaking work as well i uh, just to kind of um put it put near the front here to anybody listening who doesn't already know helen's work to just mention Thanks that she's got so some, much. some yeah. that's another thing with podcasts though because i feel like um you know one is required these days if one is working in the arts or in thought in any way that you know one has to have like a, a presence and it, it, you know one has to generate content and stuff and it, it sometimes gets frustrating that like it feels as though the content generation can um, take on more uh, can be more demanding mm. than the work itself or the work itself is very demanding and having to sacrifice time to or falling into sacrificing time to content creation you know you sometimes you're like oh i wish i was spending all my time on making films but Exactly. Yeah. No, I think one that, enriches the other, maybe. I think there, there's something really, uh, uh, you kind of put your finger on it there. I think like even questioning like our podcast, social media, and I would probably say yes. Uh, but that, yeah, that issue of um, uh, <laughs> being present by continuing to be making content versus like a, the artist process of having to go away to make content, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, versus mm -hmm. making it up front. Uh, sorry, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm jumping on top of that. I think it's interesting as well because I think that um, it, uh, it certainly, I mean, it, it varies country to country, you know, in terms of like economic systems slightly being different, but sometimes one has to um, negotiate um, uh, social media more, more than other times if one is, falls outside of certain systems because one's work is a bit different or you know it's not as commercial or um you know it, a lot of a lot of we were just actually um john and i were just in a, a lecture by uh, benjamin studebeck and we we're talking about this idea of liberty and one of the um question uh, the ideas we were discussing was this idea of like who who has the liberty to pursue um creative work and intellectual work and that um in certain regimes is granted to certain categories of person um, mm. related to um, what is comforting to the current regime in terms of um, the non-threatening role of art to justify the regime. So if one's work isn't doing that and one can't rely on um, a system that functions in a certain way because contingently at the time that one is making one's work, it's not falling into that kind of dynamic, then you have to sort of find ways. Mm. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Maybe and find I, ways to explain what you're doing because people don't know what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. As somebody who works professionally in theatre here in Canada, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's always difficult to say it. But um, yeah, because also it's, it's not the fault of anybody, right, when the way mm -hmm. that the system functions. And it's not the fault of anyone if they... Um, 
well, you know, that obviously one has agency in and one can make decisions about the way one like packages oneself or whatever. But, um, you know, there are like greater forces at work um, that maybe determine like where one falls in relation to the regime. So <laughs> sometimes I feel like I spend more time explaining what I'm in, I'm doing with my work than doing my work. <laughs> but anyway, it's the way it is. Yeah. yeah. I, I would, I, unfortunately, I, I I have to, I do view podcasts and, and YouTube as, as social media because of the pair of sociability, right? Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. listen to podcasts and they watch YouTube shows. And, you know, as my best friend Benjamin Studebaker said on The Lack, people <laughs> listen to the show and he and they feel like they, they know him personally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think this is both good and bad. For instance, um, you know, I, I do get emails, uh, sometimes very sweet emails, sometimes emails that are incredibly important to me from, from listeners. I, I should be forwarding mm -hmm. these to you, Jason because mm -hmm. they've 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 really uh sometimes they've gotten me through a week right yeah. i also get a lot of emails mm -hmm. from people who perhaps should be on medication uh a lot of it <laughs> and a lot of emails telling me you know that that i'm that i'm going to go to hell um mm -hmm. so the, the parasociability goes both ways and it's mm -hmm. it, as i said it can be both powerful and touching and it can feel like a real connection but at the same time you, I, I am suspicious right because yeah. uh, is this dangerous is this bad I, I don't know these people they don't know me or when i am listening to my podcast friends in my ears i don't i don't mm -hmm. actually know them right well i do mm -hmm. think i mean this is something that i've been thinking recently about um uh, so i had i had facebook for a very short period of time at university and then I got freaked out by the way that it interfered with interpersonal relationships and how you'd be walking through the university campus and you'd see somebody you'd never met in real life, but you knew them through Facebook or whatever. And an incident happened where my sister criticized a Katy Perry lyric on Facebook and then got a pile on and I defended her. And then I got piled on. I was like, oh, this is not worth it. So I deleted, this was like, I don't know, <laughs> over a decade ago. Um, and then I didn't have uh, in, uh, social media for, you know, whatever, a decade. And then I um, got Instagram because of my work. And at first I got Instagram and I, I realized like, well, you know, well, actually, it was actually because I had a couple of people, not um, because of me, because I had no public profile at the time, but because of um, a relationship I was in, I had two people um, pretending to be me online to get to this person. And so I thought, shit, I've got to have a public profile because then if people mm. look me up, then they'll know this is me. And because one of them did something quite embarrassing and I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to show myself. Um, and so I got Instagram. And at first I was sort of like, you know, this is nice. I, what was really nice about it was reconnecting with um, people I'd been at, like, say, school or university with. And because I hadn't had social media, I'd missed out on lots of social events or whatever. So that was fantastic. And then I sort of felt, well, you know, it's not really... The, the technology that's the problem it's the way that we interact with the technology or maybe it's the market system not the technology but of course that the technology is an emergent of the market system but i've increasingly become more worried about it and i think it was really um lockdown where a large part of actual human interaction was replaced by screen uh interactions and i increasingly felt that the issue is to do with recognition and, in, and misrecognition like intersubjectivity because from a psychoanalytic perspective when you um become a self when you develop an ego this is to do with um being formed in the presence of your parents or your family speaking subjects who must be divided subjects if they speak this is you know a, like a theoretical point from psychoanalysis that takes quite a long time to get into but the the thing is that in a psycho, from a psychoanalytic perspective, nobody is whole and complete. The, the lie in capitalism is that there are whole and complete people who maybe um, make us feel inadequate or that we can aspire to be. Or, um, and this is not just capitalism. These are various ideological regimes that there is a, you know, a, a full answer out there and somebody, somebody possesses it. There's an uncastrated other out there, but there isn't. <laughs> um, and but but the thing is, in order to become a speaking subject or to become to have a solid ego, you have to come up against the difficulties of interacting with other people who aren't whole and complete. Your parents would not be speaking subjects without themselves having been born to parents who were divided subjects and on and on and on it goes. And one becomes um, uh, sort of s solid in oneself, in one sense of self 
in the interaction with the other and sort of transferential relationships and in being seen in the mind of another who has the ability to subjectively judge and also to speak. And when one sees oneself in the eyes of another who is a subjective, who is a subject and therefore divided, one comes to see oneself or, or get a greater sense of oneself. I probably haven't described that very clearly. Actually. No, no, but anyway, but the point being, the trouble is, is, and this isn't something that just goes on in childhood. This is something that, that continues on, you know, through, throughout our lives. We, we come to know ourselves through the eyes of others. I mean, it's obvious, like we don't, obviously, except for here, we can see ourselves, but we don't really generally see ourselves. Other people see us and we come to understand ourselves through our relationships with other people. The trouble is on social media, it's very different from an intersubjective experience with somebody in real life because we're mediated by the screen, one, and then we're mediated by the market, two. So the market basically um, has as an imperative um, the selling of an ideology of wholeness and completeness. So th this is, it, we, maybe we have this, it's, you know, social media is this like public platform. We have this illusion that it's public, but it's a really privatized public, it's a commoditized public. So it's, one might air one's dirty laundry, for instance, but it is in the name of generating private profit for an enterprise. Or, you know, turning oneself into a commodity where one might say, you know, look at my difficulties in life, and this might either be as a cover story to explicate privilege or something or um, to disguise that this is actually a capitalist enterprise. So people, because of the ca capitalist undercurrents, seem to us to be whole and complete subjects on social media. And not only that, you know, this relates to the whole history of, like, say, screen media of cinema. We relate to screens in a very different way to the way we relate to human beings in, re in real life. Like the, mis the mirror stage in Lacan, you know, one of the stages one goes through in, in childhood to become a kind of, uh, to get a garner a sense of self is like, you know, we are, we feel ourselves as sort of this chaotic mess of different forces and limbs and feelings. And as we get um, to a certain point, we uh, witness ourselves in the mirror. And in the mirror, we look to ourselves as uh, somebody who has it all together because it's just like a solid image of ourselves. We, we feel, you know, disjointed and we have mixed emotions and all this sort of ambivalent experience, but there's a singular person in the mirror. And then our, our caregivers might say to us, look, that's you. And that experience of seeing oneself as a total being, that helps us set, feel like we make sense and sort of rationalize ourselves as a singular subject. Mm. So... That is well, th that's also why generally, you know, like psychologically in the screen, we see objects that or people that seem more together than they actually are in reality. And these things like this is not to say that this is always a bad thing, because as you know, in terms of the mirror stage, it's very important to go through the mirror stage to, to get that sense of um, at least some semblance of like self-organization. But um, when on social media, you know, and, and just related to like the history of screen media, obviously, like the history of Hollywood movies, you know, we are, um, we relate to these characters, these demigods on screen who seem to have, um, you know, a convincing kind of totality to their being. So we've replaced like normal human interaction where we experience the other as a divided subject um, with this experience of, because of the market forces and also because of the nature of the screen itself, that the other is whole and complete. But if the other is whole and complete, they're not actually like a normal human being. Because in order to speak and to think and to, to be a subject, one must have an internal um, sort of dichotomy or, you know, an unconscious, one must be divided. So we're essentially like, our intersubjectivity has been re replaced by sort of like a robotic interaction between imaginary whole subjects who can't recognize us because if a subject is whole and complete there's no discernment there's no subjective judgment there's no there's no lack in subjectivity and then, therefore there's no way to come to a thought or a judgment so therefore we cannot have that reinforcement from the other where they have had a perception of ourselves that then fed back to us and this weakens our sense of self and the weaker sense of self leads to anxiety dissatisfaction and you know 
becoming victim to capitalism in an even more sort of greater sense because one becomes vulnerable to the you know ideological forces at play that convince us oh yes you you are lacking but that's an exception and this is a remedy to to overcome that that sense instead of understanding that we are all lacking subjects and that um, projected totality is a lie so I think that actually and we see this sort of um, this you know drive towards um, a desperate looking down of identity might be as a result of this weakening sense of self that humans are getting because normal intersubjective experiences between divided subjects has been replaced by um, a lack of intersubjectivity because of the screen through which we relate. So there we go. <laughs> but I don't yeah. think I explained myself very well. But that's no, really I, no you did. Reason. That was no, that, that was yeah. perfect. And you know what? To to tie it in a, a, a bit with Gnosticism and what we normally do on this show, the the ancient Greeks, uh, the Oracle mm -hmm. Delphi, right, uh, had mm -hmm. Gnothi Sethon, uh, carved in stone, which means know thyself. You know, the Gnostics mm -hmm. pick that up, they actually quote it, it gets all the way down to modern esotericism. And and, and that's something that, that I take seriously. But a lot of times when people hear that, know thyself, and they're thinking about it in a mystical setting, a religious setting, a Gnostic or Buddhist setting, they think, oh, okay, I have to go into a room, I have to meditate, I have to go deep. But I mm -hmm. would argue what the Oracle of Delphi was getting at, part of the Gnostic messages and particularly one that's well expressed by the community that Jason and I are in is that you need the other to know thyself yeah, exactly. you can't just no, you you can't just sit yeah. around and go in deep and you know that, that that's something that that our, that our head bishop really kind of hammers home is is uh, uh, Sean McCann uh, um, uh, Marionis is is that we really need the other and we find we find God in the other right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. uh, finding God in the other might be might be a discussion that that is outside of uh, the realm of of this show because it might take a couple hours because how can we find God in the other if the other is divided well perhaps everything is divided and perhaps we might be looking for God in some pretty unhealthy places which, mm -hmm. which brings me to my, my uh, next question Helen which is mm -hmm. what, what might surprise people about your work uh, is that uh, theology pops up a surprising amount um, so yeah. what, what, what good is theology in, in a, in a secular and a non-religious world? And you, you're not, you're not a religious person, right? Even though no. this, this, this theology, theology does play a, a role in your work. So yeah. can you tell us like what, what good, uh, theology might do us here in the 21st century and why an atheist <laughs> might care about theology? So, yeah, I didn't have a religious background at all, except I would say that potentially it was, I came to understand it was maybe much more religious than I I thought because, um, yeah, we you talk about secularism, you talk about atheism, but potentially, um, you know, th this is uh, the, you, um, uh, thinking of the Nietzsche text. This is from it's the Shadow of God, right? So, um, I'm going to quote this terribly. I have a, a whole aspect in a documentary film about this. that you can't remember, it. <laughs> but this is the idea that we have um, we have killed God, but the Shadow of God cast on the cave wall for a thousand years okay i'm butchering that nobody at me i need to read <laughs> i haven't had much time to read but anyway but the point being is, is that we can we can we can um believe that we have <laughs> killed god in the outside world but god still persists god today is unconscious as the can would tell us so the atheist might think that um they aren't religious but the religious impulse still exists beyond a sort of rationalist level and perhaps it's more dangerous to consider oneself an atheist because one might be blind to one's own beliefs at least if one acknowledges one is religious then there is a you know a, a, a modesty in a way in uh, or an honesty in understanding the religious dimension to one's um subjectivity and the way i would interpret religion because one can i think have and i think the best of christianity does this a religion that is autocritical so a religion that maybe revolves around, uh, a, let's say, a theology of um, pointing out the way that religion functions. And I think psychoanalysis mm. is sort of like a, an a-religious practice that helps us undermine the toxic dimensions of the religious tendency of the human being and psychoanalysis explains that this religious tendency comes out of um, 
the way in which humans are born too soon and the way in which they enter subjectivity. And mm. the human subject is born too soon in psychoanalysis. I mean, this is sort of like a, a biological explanation, which is that we, we're bipedal beings and we have small pelvises and big heads. So we have to be born in sort of a fetus state. If you look at like a horse or, a, or an elephant on the Sahara, they're born and they sort of are able to run and fend for themselves. But we are uh, born as fetuses, we're sort of born too soon. And we, we remain part of our mother for, um, or that, the person who births us, for a certain period of time until such time as we, we separate. We, um, we become a, a being that can sort of fend for themselves in a way that's, you know, more, um, a, a more adequate way than when, when we're first born. And this um, leads to a sort of second birth, which is a birth into language. And the birth into language happens because this separation, so we have the separation from mother, um, inside to out and then the separate the second birth uh, from the mother from um, being part of the mother into subjectivity and subjectivity is generated by the frustration that the infant um, experiences in the separation and the separation uh, generates the need to speak to, to communicate um, and basically language uh, emerges in the failure to communicate so um, the child needs to express what they need because um, the parent, and this is as well, by the way, to go back to insubjectivity in the way that the parents fail, but in the failure is the success, is that the parents themselves don't really know what the child needs. It's like, so, you know, you might think, so you're, you're tired, let me put you to bed. But the, the parent has to do a whole amount of interpretation in the child's cries in the first place uh, because the parent themselves is not an all-knowing being. And this sort of, um, frustration and difficulty is what generates language because the language is there to fill up the gap that happens in the frustration of communication. Mm. Um, so yes, but the, the point being where, where religion, you know, because again, that there, there, there's a sort of like multifarious ways to understand the word religion, but in this context, I'm talking about um, the tendency for a human to believe that they can f fill up a lack that they experience from that is um, they're endowed with upon their second birth into language because they always had this experience that there was something there before they entered into the frustrating world of having to communicate and to speak and to lack because um, you know to, to not have because the not have generate not having generates language itself so and what I would say is it's not that um, Eden did exist, but Eden only existed in so far as it was lost. So the mother's breast takes on this kind of magical quality because it was experienced as um, being something that the child had immediate access to and then was frustrated from. But that period of time, so, you know, the, the womb itself is a tomb, you're, you're dead before you're alive, you know, you didn't exist before you were born. So the sort of um, return to oneness, for instance, that one might, you know, hope for in this sort of ideological um, pursuit for wholeness and completeness is, is a death in, in the first instance. And then as soon as you're born into the world, you're already born into antagonism because your parents also are divided subjects. But because you are part of the mother and the mother is sort of taking the best care of you that she can, you, you aren't yet a speaking subject, but you have this experience when you enter into language that there was something better that you know exists and you imagine you could get back to, but you can't. And not only can you not get back to it because oneness is death from this psychoanalytic perspective, but also the oneness never existed in the first place. And this is maybe where Lacan gets more Hegelian than other um, psychoanalytic theorists, because even in that period of time when one was at one with one's mother, there was no oneness there because the mother was already a speaking subject. But the point being is that this this pursuit of a return to wholeness, you know, is tied into this idea of death drive because oneness is a return to oneness is a return to before life is a return to death. Um, so, I mean, I guess there's a, there's a whole um, like universe to get into in terms of how this relates to, to atheism. But the point being is that there is not um, a pure rationality in the universe in which we live. If we if we buy into the Big Bang, this is like a prime example of everything is generated from 
antagonism between light and dark or on and off or one and two or the oscillation between whatever particles. Um, or I don't know how, I guess there's various theories with the Big Bang. And again, don't at me, I'm not a scientist, but you know, <laughs> something becomes in, so infinitely small that it becomes um, infinite. <laughs> complaints yes yeah, send the complaints um but this is the thing <laughs> as well by the way with podcasts is like you have to be able to have these conversations to sort of work out mm -hmm. what you think anyway and we, we are kind of closed off from doing that in this in this sort of the world in which we live but um uh, yes can i just to jump in there for a second yeah. uh it's something that you said a little earlier that really struck me that i want to um uh re-articulate in a way in a thought that i've been having a lot regarding yeah. uh uh, the sort of the the efficacy of spirituality or, and religion mm -hmm. is that I think like um, the 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 worst approach you can take to religion is to try to confuse it with truth. Yeah. Um, like yeah. that uh, uh, that there doesn't um, like getting hung up on the like world created in six days, you know, mm -hmm. or afterlife or any anything where you're where you are trying to presume a specific truth mm -hmm. is is uh is where religion is sort of not no longer helpful uh, mm -hmm. and where it's at its most helpful is when it's like trying to be as resonant as as art can be in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in uh and helping you connect with uh with with that lack like with that mm -hmm. with this understanding of a world of of uh, of adversarial elements and and yeah. like frustrating this and things like that it's like mm -hmm. so the 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 best metaphors it can it can give you to deal with that are uh, are where it's are, like are where religion, spirituality, etc., can help, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and where like where it, <laughs> where it causes the most problems is when it's like, oh no, you are one hundred percent going to go to heaven if you do the following checklist, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know. Um, uh, but this is this is the interesting thing because in a way it's like it's like the dialectic of religion. Lacan says only only a Christian can be an atheist, right? So the, the way that what what is, I guess it's got out there is that it's only by, like throwing oneself into uh, certain beliefs is not necessarily a bad thing because often one and this is I, I guess this this phrase relates to what I try to do with the films that I make is that by throwing yourself into a belief almost is the way in which a I don't know truth or, or, or um, a dynamic of reality is revealed to you, which is that everything falls ultimately into contradiction. So the more one pursues something with certainty, the more one falls out of the other side. But in a sense, yeah, in a, in a sense, though, it's like the, <laughs> the atheist is the most, well, it depends what we mean by religion, but Mm -hmm. can be the most religious person if we if we interpret the word religion in let's say it's um one you know the, the sort of uh, one one way in which it's understood which might be sort of magical thinking or detachment from reality or something like that because there is a truth in reality that can only be encountered when one throws oneself into reality which might be through something like blind belief. Like I didn't grow up religious, but I did um, throw myself into uh, a form of psychoanalytic thinking that I would say is, is very magical thinking and that very quickly after a few months revealed itself to me to be very limited. But mm -hmm. I don't think I would have encountered the limitation. I, I returned to a position I already had, but maybe with greater knowledge and I wouldn't have encountered that philosophical insight if I hadn't thrown myself into this way of thinking that mm -hmm. didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's also something I think interesting here about uh, like so a uh, bit of a segue but another great mm -hmm. podcast out there is called uh, the Secret History of Western Esotericism podcast okay. or SHWEP. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's very, like, he's, he's very slowly taking everybody through the history of esoteric mm -hmm. thought. And one of the things that's interesting is as he got to Christianity, one of the notes he made is that um, what was really interesting about uh, the advent of it when it became a really, like, prominent religion was that there was, there was a real focus on big T universal truth. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, and that and that was something that was actually kind of like confusing to like the Romans and Greeks and, and stuff around yeah. them who were like uh, pagans, but they weren't like their their religious perspectives weren't so totalizing. Like yeah, yeah, there, there was never a moment. Well, I mean, actually, who knows who? Uh, <laughs> I presume there wasn't a moment where somebody was going. I have to logically understand Zeus to be in every corner of the universe. It was simply mm -hmm. like Zeus, Olympus, whatever, I'm going to go do my job now, you know? Mm -hmm. But then there was this exciting idea, but then also this totalizing idea mm -hmm. that I, 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 where I'm going here is that I think like what, what I, what, what you, what strikes me about what you mentioned is that only when you have such a totalizing idea, can you then embrace what the lack of that idea has to it? if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I guess this is something that's in Hegel. I mean, there's a lot of people who've like, re well, people would argue that it's there in, in Paul, in, in Christian thought, but there's people who've like reinterpreted Christianity atheistically, which mm. is that, yeah, it's only through, as you explained, Jason, throwing yourself into this belief that one comes to the fact that the cross maybe represents the end of meaning or something. but. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you talk about like um, Greco-Roman thought and religion where antagonism and contradiction is woven into the fabric of the way that, you know, that the network of deities, so mm -hmm. they are divided subjects. So th the tragic is in there because they are subjective and they, you know, have influence on the world and you can't trust them because they're fallible like everybody else. And then we're sort of yeah, it's going to the sort of universal truth where maybe a certain interpretation is that there's like an, an almighty singular being, but then maybe through um, an encounter with or through um, engaging with that belief, one might come to understand the limitation of that belief. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and it's interesting because I guess this, this relates to, to capitalism as well, because um, there, is, there is very, if we, if we interpret religion, and I, I actually don't, I think there's a lot of positives to religion. So again, don't at me, but like, I'm just saying that this sort of, um, <laughs> the, the, the downside of religion, let's say doctrine that maybe we, you know, we understand religion as, or we atheistically assume that we're above. Um, and you know, this is why it's so, so tragic in today's world, because it's obviously operating, um, a huge amount of magical thinking operates in related to the commodity and the the promise that the commodity offers us and because of this um, ideology of promise we are we allow for a huge amount of exploitation and inequality um and we have a, a, a huge amount of confidence but the issue with capitalism is that the problems of capitalism are, are mystified and i think one of the ways in which they're mystified is the denial of religious thinking that operates within the market system itself so and we you know mm. snobbishly look at other parts of the world or or dynamics in our history where we're like look at those you know the, these people who believe in this sort of way but you know one might say that there is at least um something uh different i don't i don't think anything's better than anything else per se but like it, it is not great to have religion operating unconsciously through the market <laughs> Mm. You know, you know, you think about like, let's say, like Judaism and sort of the, the Jewish religion. And there is there is, a, you know, an atheism to Ju Judaism as well in a certain way. But it's sort of you, you engage in these practices on a Friday and Saturday and then you can kind of you you exercise in a way this dynamic within the human subject in an honest way. And then you, you've done it and you can get on with your week kind of thing. Um, but now, you know, it's operating all around us in a denied way. And I mm. think this leads to a lot of confusion and dissatisfaction um, and a, a sort of like surprise at how shit things can get <laughs> because we're you know, consciously in control of what that I think that one is ever in control of this sort of like dynamic within human subjectivity. But I think the, the repression of it is something that's not productive. Yeah. Mm. To, to illustrate what you're saying, there was a, 
uh, an article that went uh, uh, a little bit viral in Canada from our, our public pro broadcaster, the, the CBC, on their website. And it was a Canadian religious uh, sociologist talking about how, how Disney is a kind of religion, is becoming a kind of religion, how mm -hmm. people have a religious uh, relationship to Disney, right? So I think this is kind of an example of what you're talking about. And perhaps if we knew how religion worked and how we can have uh, religious relationships to things that aren't very religious and perhaps it's not that healthy. Like, I, you know, I want to go to Disney World. I haven't gone yet. I, I like Disney movies, right? But perhaps to have a religious connection to this large corporation and, a, and you consider your quote-unquote community to be fellow fans, perhaps this isn't the best for human flourishing. And perhaps some of these dynamics, people wouldn't fall into them if they kind of understood that this is how human beings relate to the world in many ways. Mm -hmm. We have these behaviors that, that uh, are, I'm not going to say we're inherently religious beings. Uh, that is what I mean, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> but we have these behaviors that have, that seem to be programmed into us that are, are central to our psyche, to the, to the dynamics you're talking about, about how we're formed into subjects. And they're, uh, we're stuck with them. And maybe there's healthier and unhealthier ways to, mm -hmm. to relate to it. Um, and also to, to mm -hmm. clarify a few things, or, you know, we're talking about the show, uh, and as I was saying at the beginning, what does any of this have to do with, with Gnosticism? So I'd like to pick out some of the Gnostic themes. I, I'm just <laughs> corresponding with a, with a, with a scholar uh, that we are going to have on the show, and she also flat out said, well, you know, obviously Gnosticism is in Lacan. I don't know why everybody doesn't see it. And I'm like, well, you're one of the three people with PhDs in the entire world that I know of who also, who has seen it. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's very interesting, Helen. I, I think Perhaps some people's heads uh, poked up who are very familiar with, with the religious Gnostic mythology, because we're, we're talking about Eden being an illusion, Eden being the womb, Eden being kind of a trap. In Gnostic mythology, Eden, Eden is a trap. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a false reality. It's, it's, it's a dream created by this, this, this false god to, to keep human beings uh, separated, uh, confused, and lost. And some of the uh, Gnostic texts actually refer to the womb as Eden. So it's so very, very interesting. And also, you know, Gnostic mythology has this idea of a fake god that rules this mm -hmm. world. And it's okay. usually, it's usually uh, visualized as a, as a snake with a lion's head. But th there are some textual references to uh, visual it as a womb or perhaps a female genitalia. So it's, it's very yeah. interesting how, how some of this does, does kind of tie in. Now, I'm not saying mm -hmm. that the, the ancient Gnostics were the Conians, but they were very psychological. And I think they are coming mm -hmm. to, to some of the same insights. And what's really sort of pulled me in this direction was, was rereading a, a Gnostic text, which had been lost until 1945, the, the mm -hmm. secret book of John. And in, in, in the beginning of the book, I don't know how many times I've read this text, uh, Helen and Jason. You know, Jason, you know I'm always talking about it, right? I've, mm -hmm. I've probably read it, you know, 10 times, 20 times, 30 times. It's not that long. But near the beginning of the text, it says, the one cannot be known. Flat out. Mm -hmm. How many mm -hmm. times have I read that in my life? The one cannot be known. The one cannot be known. Uh, a, a lot of times the interpretations of Gnosticism, like uh, Gnosis means to know, is that is that we completely know the one and we fuse with the one, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the text opens with the one cannot be known. And then when we go on with the text, God's wisdom, God's reflection upon itself, the absolute knowing of God trying to know itself, it can't even achieve that. If God's wisdom can't know the one, well, you know, how are we supposed to know the one? And what mm -hmm. happens when God's wisdom tries to know the one? It falls into contradiction. That's mm -hmm. in the in the Gnostic uh, narrative where there's it's very obvious that that contradiction comes into the story. Though I'd argue that it's actually at the very beginning. Also, just to tie it in, and this this is a whole show or perhaps a whole uh, uh, master's thesis. Um, <laughs> in, that, that we might be hearing more about in the future. The, <laughs> very interesting, also at the beginning of, of, of Secret John, is, is the one, all, all creation starts when the one looks into the water that surrounds it, that they call it like a luminous water, it's not a literal water, and it sees its reflection. So it's, it's the mirror stage, right? And what, what does it see? It, it, sees, it sees a wholeness. It sees a completeness. And it wants to know this wholeness and completeness. But it's, it can't know this wholeness and completion because mm -hmm. there's only contradiction. Helen, mm -hmm. talking about only contradiction, perhaps uh, uh, you've already sort of discussed this, but if you, can, yeah. if you can sort of pull it out and make it more obvious. But you taught a seminar yeah. that, that people can still take, right? It's, ar okay. it's archived. So yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. it's called the Emancipatory <laughs> Contradiction. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm going to, you know, without knowing anything about this course, uh, first I want to know how, how can contradiction be emancipatory? 
And is it is it emancipatory because it's all about how we can free ourselves from contradiction and fix ourselves through reconciling yeah. contradiction and reaching alive in its wholeness? Is that is that how it's emancipatory? <laughs> it's to do with um, how coming to terms with contradiction might allow us to have a better understanding of the world in which we live and consequently build more equitable political systems. So mm. my favorite quote of Marx is from the introduction to the critique of Hegel's possible right, which is the, um, you know, the chains bit, the picking the living flower bit. It's funny, I feel so out of practice. I feel like I talk so much. And then when it comes <laughs> to like actually explicating myself, I'm like, oh shit. What do, I, what do I even think? I don't know. But anyway, but these, you know, these aren't my ideas anyway. So everybody can find them said by better people <laughs> everywhere. Um, but anyway, but the point being is, is in this passage, it's about how, you know, that let's say one, one is enchained in the capitalist system and the, the, the chains are covered by um, uh, sort of fake flowers. And this is, let's say, ideology. And ideology is that which... Um, reconciles us to reality by papering over contradiction. And um, under capitalism, the um, ideology uh, that it operates is that which um, makes us deny the contradictions and difficulties within the market system. And the idea in this passage is that you um, you cast your gaze away, you, you, you stop being caught up in, in the fake flowers and you... Um, you know, you consequently can like pick the fake flowers from the chains, work to break the chains. And this might be like sort of collective action or, or um, confronting the reality in which we live to, to, to work collectively to, to create better, um, better systems, which must, that understanding must include an understanding of contradiction, lest, you know, the contradiction be repressed and returned in, you know, terrible ways in another, in another system. And um, Zizek has said that sort of communism is the dream of capitalism in a way, because there is this idea that communism can be, you know, that, that, that so Marx was a Hegelian, and as Hegel famously says, the owl of Minerva flies at dusk, so we, we don't know where we're going. And sometimes what can happen, and even Marx like points this out in like chapter three of the um, Communist Manifesto, there are many um, sort of fake socialists who will, um, you, you know, protect, project a sort of utopian future. And the utopianism is precisely that which guarantees that we are caught within a dissatisfying reality. So utopia in this contradictory universe cannot logically exist. That's a whole other talk. But um, what we do to sustain the image of utopia, which maybe um, keeps us uh, comforted from our, from our like, difficult reality, but because we can't access utopia logically, we sustain the illusion of the possibility of a utopia by either casting scapegoats or enemies who are the reason why the utopia doesn't exist. So this is obviously what Hitler did. Or we um, shoot ourselves in the foot constantly to prevent ourselves from getting the thing that we imagine will give us, you know, a, a wonderful transcendental experience so that we can sustain this idea that this transcendent experience or utopia exists. And that's sort of the neurotic for, for Freud or whatever. Um, but... And this is where, where Freud and I think Marx are, are similar. So in, in working to, to break the chains, which, which will inevitably um, require a dialectical understanding of reality because reality is divided. And then we can sort of go on to pick the living flower and the living flower, you know, and I think this relates to um, Freud's ordinary unhappiness is to do with navigating a divided reality and constructing uh, systems that work better based on a knowledge that incorporates an understanding of lack and contradiction. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And again, for, for angry emails, you know, we are we are sponsored by a religious organization. We, we can't agitate for a political, a specific political party within the United States, which is definitely not what we're doing right now. And uh, there are political ramifications of the thought that you're talking about. But mm -hmm. I see this as as philosophy and, and look capitalism isn't going anywhere it's going to be mm -hmm. it's, it's still going to be around in our lifetimes the whole time that we're alive mm -hmm. i'm pretty mm -hmm. sure right so no matter mm -hmm. your personal political beliefs or how you vote i i think that that you will get a, a lot out of uh some of what mm -hmm. helen is talking about and some of the sources that she's drawing on just to understand the dynamics and perhaps if you love capitalism mm -hmm. this might be the way that that it could be perfected or made no, better absolutely, or absolutely. a market system can be tamed absolutely. right so don't because send I, me the angry emails there is a godless cop. <laughs> no, because I would say also that that you know, 
as I said before, in some ways one could say, that, like, look at Stalin. Stalin was a huge right-wing deviation and sort of left-wing ideology. But, you know, some communists, if one, if one holds up communism as this utopian um, possibility, that's like literally the most capitalist thing. You know, this, this wholeness and completeness, it's a promise just over the horizon. How can we get that? Well, he's at his $6.99 a month. You can no, but um, also if um, you sign up for our Patreon and you'll get there. And the, the, you know, conservatives have a lot more in common <laughs> with uh, left leftists than, than like all out sort of liberal capitalists. Like, I think that's quite clear. But, um, but yeah, and I, also, I mean, I don't even know where I stand politically a lot of the time, by the way. And I would say I. Uh, would read Marx in, in a philosophical way rather than a doctrinal way. And I think that, uh, you know, Marx had a very good reading of capitalism. And if somebody were a capitalist who wants a system to function as well as possible for as long as possible, then, you know, one might be interested in looking at somebody who had a very interesting understanding of the market system. But again, what I would say is that from my philosophical understanding, what is what it is to be left wing, and I sometimes get tr in trouble for saying this, <laughs> is to engage in the political, and to engage in the political that politics is just the contradiction or confrontation of the contradiction between different groups of interest related to how we manage material, you know, living in material reality. So, to to say that one doesn't accept another political group is precisely, I would say, from my perspective, the least left-wing thing ever. And I would, I mean, I have a sort of a similar reading of left and right as someone like Todd McGowan would, and that is not the universally understood reading of left and right. And I think that does lead to like a lot of confusion. But I think precisely what's problematic today is that what is deemed left-wing is extremely totalitarian and you know we see in the left all the time that people get cancelled even for associating with somebody with a viewpoint a political viewpoint that the the liberal capitalism or the liberal left deems unacceptable but actually really from a left-wing perspective you know we, we don't know where we're going and we need to have this confrontation with different points of view in order to understand and this isn't just a sort of like debate sort of is what you know the pressure of debate makes a rock into a diamond or anything like that. No, it's like this. We live in a contradictory reality. We live with other people who are contradictory subjects and who have different points of view. In order to understand or to create a more equitable reality, we must understand this dynamic and that dynamic, you know, as in this, this gets us out of sort of the magical thinking, the ideological thinking, which is all to do with cancelling contradiction and like you know including in subjectivity and this leads to toxic sort of forms of um you know organizing society but actually we do need this confrontation between all these different kinds of points of view and often there is much more in common uh, with point you know in terms of political different political points of view than, than we than we would choose to 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 admit you know you listen to like the most sort of uh, let's say, stereotypically right-wing religious person, you ask them their understanding of what heaven is, and it sounds like a lot like communism, for instance. So I think a lot of people, and I, you know, I don't even know if I, I don't know what, as I say, I don't know what I identify with politically. So I'm talking about this from a philosophical perspective. And I think that um, in terms of discourse, we have to confront all kinds of perspectives because of the divided nature of reality and the divided nature of subjectivity. And this leads to um, different interpretations of reality that must be allowed to exist. And it's in the, the cancellation, this sort of, um, um, you know, Hegel has this sort of idea of the beautiful soul, where one, um, you know, the, the children sort of go through this, um, it's sort of like a paranoid schizoid, like, position in, in childhood when a child is sort of coming to understand that they have darkness within themselves you know that they're experiencing sort of bad thoughts whatever and you know they start to imagine at night that there's a scary monster in the cupboard and that's sort of a way that they manage the darkness within themselves that they're coming to, to sort of realize and obviously this, this political scapegoating the, the different perspectives don't go away and 
the antagonism doesn't go away and the unconscious doesn't go away and the sort of the you get the sort of more reaction re return of the repressed if we don't sort of have honest and uh, like conversations that acknowledge this so um yeah but i do understand that a lot of these like the term but again like this is language itself language fails language is like the slippery slope a slippery piece of soap that it never hits the nail on the head you know <laughs> like and that's that's why language is what it is if it wasn't for the fact that language fails we wouldn't have conversation we wouldn't have um we wouldn't have comedy we wouldn't have trans you know the difficulties of translation we wouldn't have art art is like or let's say poetry is like the the um you know the like the yawning kind of um excess that happens because of the failure of language so in terms of politics like i know that when i say marx like this this means so much to so many different people and you know i mean this is like because I, I used to work a lot as a translation so that there's this sort of idea in translation like how google translate can never really work because you cannot binarize language and every word that you have has a sort of a universe to it so there's um, a famous french translator who has this who i was listening to and he was talking about the word bread like when you translate the word bread in france like there is not the same universe of meaning like bread might mean like uh, meat, having, you know, meat, meals or lunch or a baguette or sort of good, good artisan food or something like that, or the people. Yeah, it's, it's very painful to uh, translate it. Oh. Yeah, but in America, you have, <laughs> but yeah, in America, you might have you know, the idea of money, like bread, earning a living and, you know, sort of shitty things in a disgusting, like horrible school lunches or something like that. So like you have this universe of meaning. And so like when I, I understand the terms left and right in a certain way, and I know lots of people don't understand those terms in those, those ways. And sometimes I, I identify, well, I think a lot of people identify aside from the terminology, a lot of what's going on in the left is much more right wing. So it's difficult to talk about these things, but yeah. I think to be political is to talk about these things. Yeah, no, I, 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 I really, I really agree, and I, I, I'm really, you know, I, I'm really disgusted and, and sad, and, and this is also tied into us being locked down uh, uh, during COVID, tied into the relation through screens, but just the echo chamber, right? I just, mm -hmm. I rarely talk to anybody who has a different opinion from me, and uh, I know that that is not healthy. But I, I do want to move on, Helen, because because time is 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 ticking, and mm -hmm. we really got to talk about your work as a filmmaker. Um, yeah. <laughs> how did you how did you get into filmmaking? What what drew you to um, it? Like what and what do you like about the medium? So what drew me to it? I was um, interested in languages growing up. That's sort of like my special interest, I guess, when I was a young person. And because of my father's job, he was a sort of a military diplomat. So we lived in lots, lots of different countries and I became very interested in languages. And my degree, my first degree was, in, well, not my first degree, my, my degree was in languages. Um, but I um, basically being a little bit, um, somebody who likes to make my life easy for myself, I realized that I could get very good at languages by watching loads of movies in another language. And this was in the time, this was sort of like 2003, 2004, when I really started to do this in my kind of early mid teens. And, um, you know, I just watched the same VHS like a million times, but I really got into film through my interest in learning languages. And then I did a languages degree and I, really like literature as well like literature is you know um a big thing in languages degrees but also you know you can look at look at film i actually wanted to um do something completely different with my life which was uh, be a professional athlete at one point but i uh, couldn't because i had this illness that was undiagnosed for a long time when i eventually found out what it was i had been getting like really crap at the sport that i did during the time that i was undiagnosed with this illness and um i took a job during this time which i wasn't that satisfied in um as we sort of trying to work out what I wanted to do. And then when I found out what my health condition was and I realized I would never be a professional athlete, I was like, right, okay, let's end this pursuit. And then let's look at something that I'm, you know, have been interested in um, prior to this, which was film, but I never really thought, it was really the shock of sort of finding out what was going on in that, in that side of things that made me um, focus my interest on, on film. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously not um, an easy thing to do um, because films cost a lot of money and uh, this leads to a lot of sacrifice and especially if you're making films that maybe are um, 
I love I love all kinds of films. And I think because the power of the medium transcends whether you're making sort of an art house film or some sort of Ponzi philosophy, philosophy film or something like that. Um, and actually, I think that the, some of the most philosophical films follow a more sort of um, uh, base, maybe um, visceral, uh, like narrative structure. Yeah, noir rather than example. sort of like an hour. Yeah, yeah <laughs> not, they're crime, not sort of an, crime thrillers. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, exactly. <laughs> and not yeah. There's air, airy fair. I mean, I we sort of did a version of a crime thriller in a sort of philosophy film that we made, but um, but some of these sort of more experimental sort of airy fairy films that don't get to the point. You know, I think actually they're maybe not quite as powerful. I don't the subject heavily as as the more kind of um, start to finish. Um, you know elaborate kind of river narrative but you know I've been doing that now um I started to make films when I was uh, just before I was 25 so that was um nine years ago and uh, yeah, I've been doing that ever since yeah and various things on the side as well yeah and uh, uh Jason you, you watched and enjoyed uh one of Helen's films what's it what's it called again <laughs> uh all one was how I pronounced it yeah. um but uh, yeah, uh, the, apparently it can be read other ways, John. Yeah, I, I, I've always read it as, as a loan, uh, but I'm sure we can probably get a, a few more readings out of that title. But it's, uh, we're going to link it up. It, it, is, it is free online. It, it is public. Um, and it actually explores a religious parable. And I don't think I've ever told you this uh, before, Helen, but uh, it's a religious parable. It's, it's originally from Buddhism that, that I use so much in, in my local community here in Montreal that I think everybody will, will quit if I say it one more time. So, really? uh, you know, but I remember. Really? That that's, yeah, yeah. So, so I I remember when I was, you know, first looking for a thesis advisor or like, you know, hunting around, you know, I, I saw your, I, I saw that film. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, that it's a sign, but no, it's not. But you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but uh, uh, <laughs> we will link it. You can watch it for yourselves, but can you tell us like a bit about it? Yeah. So I actually, I hadn't heard this parable, but I was listening in on another podcast being recorded and somebody recounted this parable. And I just thought this was, you know, would be so, it's so cinematic and, um, it kind of aligns with what I try to do in the filmmaking that I, I do. And I thought it would be very cinema cinematic to set it in Ireland, where I'm from, in, um, you know, in the Irish language. Um, and I guess that the reason why I... Well, I actually think parables function in a, in a way that's similar to the, the kind of films that I make, which is to do with using the sort of very riven narrative form to sort of trick the viewer in a way. <laughs> Although I think this, ha even if I explicate that it's a trick and um, the reveal of whatever film is, um, it's, it's obvious that it's gonna end up the way it is. Like I, I think films still work whether you, whether you explicate the plot or not, actually, unless like it's M. Night Shyamalan or something and that's like all relying on a kind of, um, you know, trick. Um, but yeah, so this film basically is about um, the transferential relationship between a woman and, and a, a religious figure. She's lost her child and she goes on, well, her child is unwell and she goes on sort of a, uh, a quest to, to heal the child and she visits lots of people who don't have any remedies and eventually she, she meets this sort of um, witch high on a mountain who gives her a remedy, which is that she must find a very specific form of seed and brew it into a tea and feed it to the child. But the um, the the seeds can only come from um, a house that isn't marked by by loss, you know, death or whatever. And um, so the young woman enters uh, the community of the world and she goes house to house and in in hearing the stories, because obviously she finds no one who hasn't hasn't suffered loss, um, which is. The nature of reality because obviously life is terminal as a terminal illness <laughs> you know so um she she encounters the fact that nobody um has you know not experienced grief and and loss and death and through this communal experience she's able to come to terms with the loss of a child and, and bury the child sort of collectively with people in her community um and she comes to understand that sort of death is part part of life but it's, it's, she only, I mean, I guess this sort of like relates to this idea of only the Christian as the atheist. It's only through the sort of like reckless pursuit of a possible wholeness and completeness of an, a universal truth that she comes to a more dialectical universal truth, which is that like life is marked by death. Um, but it's only, you know, she, that, that, um, that healing would not have been able to be possible unless it was for 
unless she she um, you know engaged in this belief that it was possible that her child could be saved. Um, but I I so I really like using film to to bring people. I would call it like to the gaze of lack. So. Um, one identifies with a character who is very invested in um, pursuing something or achieving something or um, finding something out and then what is revealed. And this is what, you know, it was much more common in, and I think the film does this so well, but, you know, in um, pre-neoliberal cinema, you know, this is, this is, this is The Wizard of Oz. Um, it's actually it's only in getting the, the, the audience to really invest in this way that one can make the gravity of the contradictory lacking nature of the universe. <laughs> I feel like, so yeah, I, I like to bring people along for a ride and then make them sorely disappointed or, you know, use this form to communicate some truth about reality that I don't think um, lands that well. Um, well, I think film has a particularly is a particularly adept at getting this to land. I think that you know you look at a Rothko painting; it does the same thing. Not that like my films would ever be <laughs> anywhere near as good as that, but um, I feel like film is a technology that can allow us to experience this sort of um, universal, not in reality. I want to hear, are, are you guys uh, good to go for another 10 or 20? Because I, I want to hear. I can do 10 probably. Okay. Jason, yeah. uh, uh, I'm going to unleash Jason because I, I know he'll probably want to say some things about uh, art and film. <laughs> Before, you know, the, going back to an earlier conversation, you know, it, it's a real shame that, that we really have to commodify everything, be it religion, our hobbies. Uh, Patreon.com slash Gnostic. For as little as a dollar for beef and media per month, you can help us keep the show going. Uh, you can also uh, give us more than that. You can give us less than that. You, you can set a, a cap on the amount. We usually do four to six pieces of media per month. We don't give you anything for your support, but we give you early access to the shows when I have the time and uh, <laughs> to put them out. Uh, but that said, we're, we're incredibly grateful. And if you want us to give you something, just, just let us know. I'm always trying to figure out like uh, uh, what we can give back to our, our patrons. We don't want to put... Uh, content behind a paywall in this particular situation because of you know there is a lot of religious content and we want to spread the gnosis you can do one-time donations at paypal.me slash gnostic okay uh the jason art film uh, the lights camera action go <laughs> um yeah no I, I i a lot of this is actually just me, me saying that i would agree i think the only thing i would say is i think um i think film is particularly adept at it uh because of the but I think it, in in many ways because of the kind of the 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 strategies of storytelling that have grown mm -hmm. through through history of like mm -hmm. a theater and uh, literature mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. you know film is kind of ha uh, also has <laughs> I think um, unlike theater in which the audience can look uh, at the lights or at the the the, the set instead of the actor or kind of thing like that or um, a novel which the reader can put down film mm -hmm. is kind of like unless you leave the theater you're going to see Mm -hmm. Like there, there's a such a, a strong amount of control, yeah. So that, that's that's possible there, which I think is is uh, is fascinating. And I think one thing that I um, uh, so uh, what I was really struck by in terms of what you were saying was the um, that sense of the uh, giving somebody like a hope and then like kind of taking it away or or not fulfilling that that promise. And I think there's something like in a way maybe all like uh, all project, like all art projects can can hit or hit that button at varying levels of efficacy, mm -hmm, if that mm -hmm, makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's right, yeah. Like in some of them may, in fact, even by, by striving to hit it as hard as possible are the ones who f are furthest from the mark, if that makes sense. No, that, I think that's but, absolutely true. But the thing is, it's like art, art I would say, I, th I mean, I am biased because I like art, but I think it is the most powerful force in the universe, best life of love, I don't know. But no, I think art precisely because it tolerates contradiction. That's why it's so mm. powerful. And that's why I think it's so, um, we have an appetite for it. Um, and film, interestingly, I think sometimes films, um, let's say politically speaking or philosophically speaking, that are most useful to talk about are the ones that really try to paper over contradiction with like an ideological narrative and they, they're so rubbish. And it's so obvious what this sort of like 
I mean, some some films that are very celebrated do this, and I don't want to like. I I feel bad sort of naming names, but there are some <laughs> films that are like so ideological that I. But they make for great like conversation fodder. But um, but yeah, no, I and I think the thing is that that art that doesn't tolerate contradiction is, you know, propaganda really. <laughs> um, but 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 I think art, and obviously, yeah, sometimes if one is trying to communicate something, even though it might be a dialectical truth, does that still make it art? I do mm -hmm. think that if art still needs to be organized around ideas. Um, and I think that when art, when the medium itself puts a viewer or a spectator in a position, so it's less to do with like, like explicit ideas, but rather, mm -hmm like a subjective position in the viewer. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I actually do make propaganda and not art. You know, that's the uh, question I ask myself. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm having a kind of an intense moment right now because part of what, part of the reason I got into Gnosticism was because it in, it, in its poetry described what it feels like when I'm directing a play. Mm -hmm. um, when, I'm, when I'm writing poetry, when I'm, when I'm making anything creative and, mm -hmm. and it feels like it's working. Mm -hmm. But why, why I'm mentioning that right now is because I think what, I, what you may have helped me uncover is that for me particularly, the moment that I'm often chasing is that moment in which the art is holding a contradiction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is allowing the contradictory space to be present and not answered, but, but felt, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, actually, the uh, uh, art projects that, that create that space and then try to answer it directly, I've, mm -hmm. I've often felt that that's where they fail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas the, like, in fact, uh, um, I, just, I just watched your, your films earlier this morning and I feel like part of what they did so well is they sort of held that space and then, then we're like, and now, you know, <laughs> go have coffee, like, go, go talk about this, go. Because, go no, I, yeah. yeah, it's interesting because this is, again, I think, you know, so much film um, becomes sort of sickly and dissatisfying when yeah and because obviously there's a commo like when it's commoditized there's a this commercial imperative to promise something so mm -hmm. but the art form itself i would say the technique because partly because of as you say the sort of dreamlike state potentially this sort of super rational um very visceral way in which it engages an audience and you can say well like you know, music is universal and color is universal and all these, you know, these these projects are made collectively with lots of, you know, there's, we talk about directors, but really this is the work of like a multitude of different people. So there's ways that like on a very basic level, um, you know, maybe we can say that they, they, holler, they, they tolerate the sort of universal, which I think the only universal is lacking contradiction. But, um, but I think film itself does, it takes you on a ride and that ride, inevitably, because of the nature of reality, in my opinion, will be towards lack and contradiction. But then in a commoditized commercial sense, it, there has to be this sort of like resolution. And I mm. think the real dissatisfaction or, you know, like sort of si sickening quality to some cinema is and it, often, though, it's not it's not like base, crappy, um, you know, popcorn movie but rather sort of like um semi-elite um self-congratulatory uh <laughs> political you know where it comes to a conclusion or you know and and, and it, when 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 that happens when when there is a sort of like um and, and i i mean because i do a lot of writing and i always try to to like have the work come from an idea from a theme but the theme is not like it might be a question or it might be um and you know if the conclusion is always let's say like that but you know it will be revolving around this question but when i think a work um has an answer to the question rather than provides the multitude of voices or multitude of perspectives on this question um but i think yeah that it's interesting because i think sort of prestige cinema in a way has in some ways become the worst offender <laughs> in terms of like this ideological cin cinema you know it's the same as like you know the the honesty of the believer the kind of like trashy popcorn film which is not it which isn't claiming to be anything other than trashy but you know you can just sort of escape and enjoy it and you know it's a bit it might leave you feeling a bit empty but it's fine but the sort of 
coming to a very concrete um, apolitical, I mean, I always think these sort of like propagandistic, political, um, mm -hmm. deterministic ideas are actually very apolitical and politics is precisely the contradiction of different points of view. And when you sort of come down on one absolute certainty, I think that's actually that which prevents politics from happening. So often I think things that are that claim to be a political film are precisely not political enough. <laughs> they're annoying because mm -hmm. they're not actually doing politics. But um, but yeah, no, I, and I think film inevitably does something. Um, but it's kind of difficult because often it's difficult to place what you're doing. And it's interesting because you, you might go to um, different parts of the world where your films go down better because there is a sort of like maybe less uh, less of a domination of um, an ideology of promise or a sort of a capitalistic outlook. Or, you know, in the past, I always think of things like, yeah, The Wizard of Oz, like would, and, we, and we, we enjoy it and we watch it because we know it's a good film, but like if it was released today, would it even be able to be made? But would it get past sort of media executives who maybe are like, what does this mean? Or this isn't, mm -hmm. you know, this, is, this isn't uplift, uplifting enough or whatever, or um, yeah. Hmm. Definitely. Well, we, we, we should let you go, Helen. But before we do, uh, tell us where people can find you online, discover your work. Uh, you know, I have been flashing it up on the screen, but some people yeah. listen to this as a podcast. I will link it, but but give us your plugs. So, uh, yeah, I have uh, the podcast, The Lack. My work actually is not that findable. Uh, stuff, <laughs> basically, if you look hard enough, you can find it. But that's for a reason, because and this is to do with the stupid commoditizable re nature of reality. Like I have I have had to in the past keep my work private, but I am just thinking of just putting it all online because why not? Um, I'm working on a documentary mini series at the moment that is more mainstream that will come out next year. Um, it might even have some explicit religious themes. I know a podcast yes, that you'll does. be able to come on and talk about. It, so. <laughs> it does have explicit religious films. I'm fascinated by the religious world and religious people that are set in the world of televangelism. Um, mm. And I have written some essays. I have a sub stack. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll link it up. And, and if you go to YouTube, even though your full films aren't there, there are there are some teasers, there's some clips, mm -hmm. so uh, people people can uh, uh, people can watch those. And uh, yeah, hopefully hopefully we'll be able to put them online. But I know there's there's realities related to uh, 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 film festivals and all sorts of things that uh, that make it difficult. Uh, Jason, tell people where they can find you online. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find, just my name, jasonmemmel.com, um, and if you're uh, interested in, in theater and you're in the uh, uh, southern Alberta area, you can uh, find sagetheater.com. Um, and actually, I just wanted to say one quick little, um, I don't know, t agnostic bow I want to tie on this based on some of the stuff that, um, that Helen's been saying, is that what really strikes me is that what I often call a Gnostic mistake is when folks discover Gnosticism and want to layer on a, like on a nearly identical religion on top of like so mm -hmm. the god above god they just want to be more godlike if that makes sense um so it's like it's just a different guy with a beard and a cloud um but what i find so striking about what you're talking about is that what maybe there isn't anything on that higher level or whatever it, it whatever is conceivable is like we don't have a framework for it so that like i think what what i'm really struck by is the Part of that part of this Gnostic uh, the, um, process is to try to get beyond that lack or to try to bridge that lack and not replace it with another with not with another commodity if that mm -hmm, makes sense mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. what's what's another easily understandable concept I can just apply on top if that makes mm -hmm. sense because it's it's the question, not the answer. That's yeah, getting, that's a, exactly. a vibe I wanted to connect here. You're, you're getting comfortable with the the lack. You have to acknowledge it and be in that space, perhaps. Exactly. <laughs> to tie yeah. tie a bow, to tie a bow on the bow. Yeah. Uh, cool. Okay, my plugs. Uh, I am going to be taking a little break from life, but the great thing about um, well, actually, I'm going to be embracing life, so I'm I'm making a new <laughs> one. Well, I'm actually I've already done the work. It's I did the easy part. So, um, well, maybe said, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be not sleeping for a while. That will be quite difficult. Yes, exactly. 
exactly. Although I'm already an insomniac. I, I wish I was one of those productive insomniacs. I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm just up all night staring at the ceiling. It's great. So uh, so the, the, I'll be able to put this to, to good use. Anyways, the great thing about podcasts and YouTube uh, shows is they live on the internet forever. So who knows when you're listening to this? So you can, uh, if you're ever in Montreal, sometimes I do stuff online. My parish is holygrail.substack.com. You can, uh, I teach meditation, uh, secular meditation. Uh, mile end meta mile mile end meditation dot substack dot com. You know, I got got to give some plugs for for Jason and I's tradition. There's actually a free course that you can take online, which is joanite.org slash learn. It's an awesome course about the, the sp specific stream of Joanite mysticism and uh, Gnosticism, and it's fun. There's no requirements. You know, you, you the, after taking the course, you don't have to you know shave your head and give us all your money or anything. Uh, even if you're vaguely interested, you can check that out. Now to plug another school because. Because I want to become the world's first Chicasi millionaire, which is Chicasi.ie. <laughs> so that's uh, that's where uh, Helen does some teaching and advising, where she runs and is one of the founders of their art department, which is new. We didn't get a, a chance to talk about it. And if you are interested in some of the psychoanalytic uh, uh, aspects, uh, you can also just take a course there, right? You don't have to do degrees. You don't have to do anything. Uh, take a course or a seminar. If you're interested in some of this Lacanian, death of God, continental philosophy stuff that has come up in uh, 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 the show today, that that's a great place to, to study it. So uh, that's it. Bye, everybody. Thanks again, Helen. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.